We'll start our virtual greenhouse tour with a plant that's tasty, colorful, and action-packed. Ever wonder where peas come from? They're the seeds of a pea plant. In order to grow pea pods containing peas, a pea flower must first be pollinated. Looking at this flower, where are the four floral organs we mentioned in the intro? It's difficult to see the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils, but they are present. The petals are just arranged in a special way which hides some of the other floral organs. If we had x-ray vision and could see inside the flower, it would look like this. Most of the stamens and pistils are clustered together. So if the stamens are hidden, how does the flower get pollen onto insects so that pollination can occur? Many pea species whack bees on the back with their pollen. The bee landing on the flower causes the stamen and pistil to pop out and smack the bee on the back. The bee can then carry that pollen to the next plant. A pea plant's unfertilized ovary already looks like a tiny pea pod. After it gets pollinated and fertilized, this ovary turns into a real pea pod, which is the pea plant's fruit. Inside the fruit are the seeds, which are the peas. A mature pea pod's petals and stamen have fallen off, but you can still see the stigma as a tiny line at the bottom of the pod. Usually people eat peas when they're at this stage. If you let the pea pods keep growing, they'll eventually dry out and split apart. In the wild, pea plants need to disperse their seeds or get their seeds to grow far away from the parent plant. Wild pea plants do this by making their pods explode. When the pod dries out, it splits open and launches its seeds at speeds of up to 18 miles per hour. You could even say that pea explosions aren't really peaceful at all.
Lily pads have a more chill life. They're aquatic plants, which means that they grow in water. Lily pads can only grow in shallow water though, such as ponds, because their roots need soil to grow. Just looking at this footage here, you can't really get a sense of how big each lily pad leaf is, but they're roughly the size of a dinner plate. Many lily pad leaves are so enormous that they can actually support the weight of a small child if that child is standing in the middle of the leaf. Although lily pads don't explode like pea plants, they still have a dangerous side. Lily pads are smooth on the top surface, but the underside is often prickly. Check out that spiky thing in the water. That is a leaf that hasn't unfolded all the way yet. Ouch. The fact that water lily leaves are half submerged in water makes them different from the leaves of many other flowering plants. The half of the leaf that is submerged isn't going to get light or carbon dioxide, two things that plants need to grow. Most plants have tiny holes on the undersides of their leaves to let carbon dioxide in, but lily pads have these only on the top side. The underside of a lily pad leaf has veins that elevate the leaf above the water and transport nutrients throughout the plant. I should mention that lily pads, also called water lilies, aren't actually lilies. Their flowers are much different from those of actual lilies, which have only six tepals and six stamens. Water lilies can have tons of each floral organ, so tons of sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. Now we're going to show you a familiar plant, the sunflower. Most people think that a sunflower head is just one flower, but when we zoom in, we can see that a sunflower head is made up of many, much smaller flowers. There are two types of flowers, gray flowers and disc flowers. Gray flowers have one very long petal. Each petal you see in a sunflower head is attached to a different ray flower. Disc flowers have very short petals and make up most of the sunflower head. What would happen if you had more ray flowers than usual in a sunflower head? A normal sunflower is on the left. With more ray flowers, the sunflower head would look fluffy. That's called a double flowering sunflower, which is shown in the middle picture. With fewer ray flowers, the sunflower head would be mostly brown, which is shown on the right. Where do sunflower seeds come from? When each tiny disc flower gets pollinated, its ovary produces a single seed. Because there are many disc flowers in a sunflower head, a single sunflower head can produce many sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds can be eaten as snacks or get pressed into sunflower oil, which is often used to fry french fries. You may have heard that sunflowers track the sun. That is true. One side of the stem grows faster than the other during the day, and it reverses at night. This allows the sunflower head to face east in the morning and west in the evening, following the sun. When sunflowers finally stop growing, the sunflowers face east. This is probably because flowers that face east attract more pollinators than those facing west. Plant scientists are still studying why and how this happens. Yay, science! This next plant is related to the ginger you eat in gingerbread cookies. That spicy, flavorful taste comes from a special stem, which you can't see right now, because they're hidden under the dirt in the plant's pot. Let's pretend we have x-ray vision. Can you see those light brown underground stems now? Those tasty underground stems are called rhizomes. Ginger rhizomes are dried and powdered before they are put in cookies, but you can also buy fresh ginger rhizome at your local grocery store. How do scientists know that underground rhizomes are stems and not roots? Stems have leaves coming off of them Roots never do. Ginger rhizomes have leaves coming off of them, so they must be stems, not roots. The rhizome is just one part of the plant's stem. The rest of the stem is above ground, but you also can't see it. This is because the leaves that grow on the stem have long sheaths, which wrap around the stem and hide it from sight. You would have to peel all the leaves and their sheaths off to see the green stem inside. So just to review. The underground stem, the rhizome, is all under the dirt. It produces green stems above the soil, which support the sheathing leaves. Let's take a closer look at the flower. Is this a single flower or multiple flowers? Take a guess. Just like we saw with the sunflower, 
what might look like a single structure actually has multiple flowers. Unlike the sunflower, every flower in ginger is covered by a colorful bract. When the flowers are mature, they bloom and emerge one after another in a spiral. On this plant, you can see some of the old dead flowers at the bottom of the flower head, and some of the freshly opened new flowers at the top. So with this video, we're going to ask and show you how plants protect themselves. And one big way they do this is actually with chemistry. Um, so for example, you wouldn't eat a plant that tasted bad or made your stomach hurt um, or glued your mouth shut, so neither would an insect. And all of these um, effects are actually due to plant chemistry. Um, so in this video, the plant on the left is a poppy flower and the plant on the right is actually tobacco. Uh, many plants actually make powerful and unique chemicals and we're highlighting these two plants here because they make chemicals that affect insects but also humans. Um, so we're going to ask first how do poppies defend themselves? Um, so the poppy plant makes a sticky substance called latex which is this milky white stuff that you can see coming out of the poppy plant shown in the picture. Um, so the orb on the top of the stem is actually the immature ovary of the plant and somebody cut this ovary before taking this picture. And the plant is actually exuding a lot of latex right now um, because it's trying to protect its developing seeds. Um, so how exactly does latex protect the plant? Um, latex is very sticky, so it can glue together insects' mouth parts and stop them from chewing. Um, latex is also full of toxins, and this is probably the most important thing. So poppy makes unique chemicals that slow down the growth of the nervous system of the insects that feed on the plant. And humans have actually used some of these chemicals as medicine, um, but they can be very dangerous and addictive if used incorrectly. Um, poppy combines these poisons with the stickiness of its latex so that insects don't eat it. So now we're gonna to switch to tobacco and ask how does tobacco defend itself? So tobacco makes a different toxin called nicotine all throughout the plant. Um, nicotine reduces insects' appetite, and it actually kills them if they eat too much of the chemical. Uh, when humans consume nicotine, for example, by smoking cigarettes or vaping, it can make them nauseous and also be addicting. So cigarettes and e-cigarettes can also cause cancer because of other compounds they contain, and they're just bad news. Um, actually, for bugs and humans, nicotine is bad news for, for bugs and humans, so no cigarettes. Um, tobacco is actually closely related to wild tomato plants, which also makes large amounts of toxic chemicals um, for protection of itself. Um, on the other hand, though, like domesticated tomatoes or eggplants and potatoes are all related to each other. Um, those domesticated plants are very safe to eat because they contain only very tiny amounts of nicotine and other toxins. Um, so plant chemical defenses, in summary, they play a big role in keeping wild plants alive. Because some plant toxins are also poisonous for humans as well as insects, you shouldn't go around eating wild plants without being absolutely sure that it's something you can eat just to be safe. Okay, so this is our final video. And with this one, we're going to show you succulents and we're going to ask, uh, are all plants that look alike related to each other? And the answer is no. Um, so succulents are a great example of this because uh, many of the succulents that you see growing in these pots, they look similar to each other, but they actually come from different plant families and they're actually not related to each other at all. Um, so a succulent is any plant that stores water in thick leaves or thick stems. And you might be asking, well, why would a plant need to do this? Why would it need to store water? Um, so well, if you are going outside in a dry, hot summer day, you'd probably want to bring a water bottle with you. And plants that live in dry deserts, in a similar way, they store extra water so that they don't dry out. Um, many desert plants happen to have thick leaves and stems because it is a great way to store water. And that's actually why unrelated succulents look alike. They're actually using the same tools to stay alive in the same dry environments. Um, so now that you know that, I'm going to let you in on a big secret. Not every plant that looks like a cactus is a cactus. Um, so this Pacopodium is not a cactus. It's actually more closely related to milkweed plants. And as another example, this Euphorbia plant is also not a cactus. It's more closely related to poinsettia, which can be a little confusing. Um, but hopefully looking at these succulents has convinced you that we can't always tell plants apart just by seeing them at a distance. Um, we actually need to look at specific parts of the plants up close 
And the next part of this workshop will teach you which parts of the plants real scientists use to get important information. Um, so with this, you can possibly solve your own plant identification mystery. And let's get to it. <laughs> 